only one survived. But now, to Shea Moose, the Moose Burnham, our moose expert all the way from Nipissing University. Whoa, didn't see you there. I was just doing some bio outside. Let's walk over and talk about Elkies Elkies, the uh, North American moose. So here's a picture of our friend right here. As you can see, he has very large antlers. Everybody knows moose have antlers. Look at that, 1.8 meters long. He's almost two meters tall and weighs approximately 820 kilograms. So where do moose live? Well, they live in Canada, that's for sure. Up north in Alaska, down by the border, and also in Europe, but they're called the Eurasian elk. Still the same moose though. So, what type of habitat do they live in in these places? Well, they like boreal forests, and uh, they also prefer some tundra up north in Alaska. But uh, they do live in aquatic environments still, even though they're so big. A moose can even spend 30 seconds underwater. That's pretty crazy stuff. They enjoy to eat lilies and tall grass because they cannot bend down all the way to graze the shorter grass because they're so tall. Finally, uh, here's an interesting fact. They have a nice little thing called a bell hanging down from their neck, so there's no real purpose. So the first thing we're gonna be talking about today is biogeography. What is biogeography? Well, it's the geographical distribution of plants and animals across the globe. So a lot of people, like anybody, you go out to the street and be like, hey, where's the moose from? Everybody be like, hey, Canada, the great white north. That's not true. Our story begins uh, thousands of kilometers away in a place called Yakutia in the Russian Far East. So if we look at the Eurasian elk and the moose from North America, they are the same species, but there's slight genetic differences between them. If we look specifically at cytochrome B gene in both the DNA of the moose and the Eurasian elk, we can find these subtle differences. And what does this mean? Well, there has to be a very, very uh, common ancestor between the two, and both groups would have to experience a population bottleneck in the recent past. Okay, our journey starts about 60,000 years ago in a place called Yakutia. So the moose in Yakutia were boxed in by a mountain range running east to west and glaciers pushing the boreal forest to the south. The boreal forest is the habitat of the moose, so they had to stay in here. About 59,000 years ago and 14,000 years ago, we had two periods of global warming. This caused the glaciers to recede and the boreal forest to expand. This allowed the moose, who are now genetically almost identical, there's no genetic diversity, because this was the founder population. This is an example of genetic drift too, and we'll get back to that later. So the genetically identical moose came up and migrated to the Russian Far East. So here, some of them stopped, and some of them are still residing there today. Others crossed the Bering Land Bridge that formed because all the water was caught up in the glaciers. So it, it wasn't flowing over the Bering Strait between Russia and Alaska. So when they cr crossed over, they stayed in Alaska because again, glaciers boxed them in. They couldn't move. However, after more warming, the Bering Lands Bridge flooded and trapped the two populations on either side. Our next topic is allopatric speciation. So this is when, like in our diagram, two populations are separated by a natural barrier, such as the Bering Sea, and they cannot mate within each other. This means that the populations will start to inbreed and over time become slightly different from each other. This is why we have the Eurasian elk and the North American moose. So what happened after this though? Well, there's another warming of the climate which caused a severe population bottleneck. Our next topic is genetic drift. This is when the allele frequency within a given population changes because of chance. So this happens after, say, a population bottleneck. So after the warming of the climate in both the Russian Far East and Alaska, many moose died. This narrowed it down to a very small population. Therefore, the few moose left had to inbreed, so the inbreeding coefficient goes up, and so does homozygosity. This is when the genetic information of the moose's offspring are almost identical. 
is you keep mixing in the same alleles over and over again with no new ones. So how do we know this happened? Well, today the moose has very low genetic di diversity and about uh, 13,000 years ago, after the warming, there was a large boom in the population of both the moose in the Russian Far East and Alaska. This is very common to see after a severe population bubble. Natural selection is a real slam dunk. Charles Darwin proposed a theory that a favorable trait in an organism is determined by the environment. These traits include fur color and size. So when the moose came to Alaska, they were a lot bigger 14,000 years ago. But as the climate warmed, their food population went down. This meant that they didn't have as big of a food source. So the smaller moose, who didn't need to eat as much, survived and were able to mate and pass on their genetic information. This led to a very gradual process of the moose becoming smaller in the size it is today. Now we're going to be looking at adaptations. So what is an adaptation? Well, it's a trait that's seen within a population as beneficial uh, determined by the environment they live in. So for example, the moose didn't just stay in Alaska. They moved throughout North America once the ice from the glaciers melted and allowed them out. So when they went uh, down to the boreal forest, they established two different types of mating. So in the tundra, it's called harem mating. This is when a male moose travels with about seven female moose and they're young. Why do they do this? Well, the male moose can pass on his genetic information with a lot more than just one female moose. Also, there's more predators and less place to hide in the tundra as it's all flat. So the male moose's job is to protect the female moose and their offspring. However, in, there's tending bond uh, mating in the boreal forest. They don't have to worry about predators because there's a lot more places to hide in the trees. It's not open landscape. So the male moose goes out and spends an X amount of time very long in order to find a mate. Antlers, they're a lot bigger in the tundra because you have to worry about getting them stuck in trees. In the Bordeaux forest, if you had huge antlers, like every five seconds you'd be smacking them on one tree or the other and getting stuck. Those are the adaptations of the North American moose. This is a word. Okay, the moose has come a long way since its beginnings in Yakutia 60,000 years ago. After talking about biogeography, allopatric speciation, genetic drift, natural selection, and adaptations, we have come to a better understanding of the evolution of the moose into the one we know and love today in the Great White North.